everyone, this is Sarah from Japan and welcome back to another prophetic read along. I know I haven't done one in a while, I've been a little bit busy with some things that were going on in the family. As many of you know, my father in law has uh, stage 4 cancer, and um, they told us in November that he was cured, and he's just had a rel relapse, so obviously, he's not cured. And he's away getting uh, six brain tumors removed. Um, but anyway, um, so I told you last Friday, and today is now Thursday, um, that I would do an intro, okay, on, on the book of Ezekiel. All right, so I already did chapter one. I went ahead and did chapter one because I felt the urgency at the time to do that, and I didn't have my uh, my King James version, the one with the intro. Okay, I had my little one, not the big one. Okay, so I have my Bible today, so I'm going to read to you the intro so you get a little better idea of what Ezekiel is talking about, because there's a lot of imagery and a lot of words, you know, they, um, like I said before in chapter 1, that people in the ancient times, they didn't know. They saw things in the future that they couldn't describe, okay? I mean, they, they could describe it to the best of their ability, but it sounds, you know, if you don't have any understanding, then it sounds like they were, you know, perhaps smoking something. But, like, for instance, John, okay, John in Revelation talks about uh, these these giant, um, large, horse-sized, or whatever, uh, locusts with tails like scorpions. And this is in the latter days, so what is like that? Perhaps a helicopter, right? Well, there are other things, too, you know, that he didn't have, you know, the words for. And so he just, you know, he explained it to the best of his ability, what these visions were. And it's the same with Ezekiel. So, you know, we have a lot of things that are, at first sight, you know, a little bit confusing. And we don't want to know what he's talking about. But as we read, we kind of get a better idea. Okay, so anyway, let's read the, the intro to the book of Ezekiel. Okay, so it says here, Following the surrender of Jerusalem by King Jehoi Jehoiakim, in uh, 597 BC, the Babylonian army took 10,000 captives, including Ezekiel, who was in training as a priest. When Ezekiel was 30 years of age, about five years later in captivity, and normally would have taken up his duties as a priest, God called him to be a prophet. Okay, so he was 30 years old. Okay. And normally would have... Uh, sorry. This calling was accompanied by a vision. Visions and symbolic actions played significantly significant can't speak right significantly in Ezekiel's ministry as a captive in Babylon Ezekiel was the first prophet to preach to his own people on a foreign soil so, so you see Jeremiah you know he foretold, foretold the captivity and he was actually talking about times during the captivity but he was in Jerusalem okay whereas Ezekiel was actually carried off into Babylonian territories so anyway into Babylon so uh, he had a great responsibility of declaring God's message to the exiles he's placed strong emphasis on individual responsibility before God see Jeremiah and Isaiah talked about the sins of the fathers and how the people as a whole for generations would not repent so they were being punished but here Ezekiel talks about individual responsibility for sin Okay. One major problem the prophet had to face was worship. The people were accustomed to worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem. But being captive in Babylon, it was impossible to worship as before. But as a result of the exile experience, worship became more precious, even though they were separated from their homeland in the temple. I myself can tell you, I kind of, I kind of understand this, this you know, um, thought that worship is precious because, you know, I can't go to a church. My family is Buddhist, and they strictly forbid me to be a Christian. So I cannot worship openly and gather with other Christians and worship in a house of worship. Okay? That just does not happen for me. So I have to worship in secret. You know, and I worship, and I have fellowship with everyone on YouTube and on Facebook. But that's the way it is for us. Okay? So uh, even though they were separated from their homeland in the temple, they were also freed from the bonds of idolatry. Because they were carried away, 
they weren't able to, to, you know, they were freed from the bonds of idolatry. It's actually a good thing for them. While in captivity, a practice they had repeatedly fallen into throughout their history. When Ezekiel was taken captive, Daniel had been in Babylon for over eight years, had a place in the palace, and had already attained great fame. When Ezekiel was taken from Jerusalem, Jeremiah, who was older than Ezekiel, was preaching to the people in Jerusalem, continuing to prophesy the destruction of the city. One of the dominant emphasis of the book is, They shall know that I am God. That's the emphasis. They shall know I am God. Okay? Ezekiel's message explained why Israel was in captivity and the actions of God. The people were guilty of unspeakable abomination, and through punishment they would truly come to know God. Ezekiel's Vision and Call, chapters 1 through 3. The first verse in the book refers to the 30th year. This most likely has to do with Ezekiel's age at the time he was called to be a prophet to the exiles. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1. In 593 BC, the river Kabar was a canal that connected to the Euphrates River above Babylon and ran southeast through Nippur. As that, and that's found in chapter 1, verse 3. As Ezekiel gazed over the plain, he saw what appeared, to be a, what appeared to be storm clouds with lightning and thunder. He saw four cherubim, four cherubim, okay? Living creatures, that's in chapter 1, verse 5. Each cherubim had four faces and four wings, like you saw in the beginning of this video. Okay, I put the imagery up, okay, so that you would kind of get a picture of you know, how the book of Ezekiel is sequenced, okay? And that's why the pictures, that's why the slides are up, okay? So, um, each cherubim had four faces and four wings. Their wings were outstretched with the four of them arranged to form a square. There were also four immense whirling wheels, and you saw that too. One beside each cherub. Figures of cherubim decorated Solomon's temple. So Ezekiel may have well been familiar with their appearance. Other examples of cherubim in the Bible include two cherubim who had had their wings spread out over the mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, and that's in Exodus uh, 25, verse 18. Okay, cherubim had guarded the entrance of the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned, keeping them from, from the Tree of Life. That's Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Their likeness was also embroidered on the veil of the tabernacle. Okay, that's Exodus chapter 26, verse 31. As Ezekiel received his call, he was aware that it would be a life of difficulty. He received his message from God in the form of a, of a book and was commanded to eat it. So, he was commanded to eat it. And I hope that you also, in this day, are eating of the word. Okay, we feed on every word from the mouth of God. Okay? Chapter 3, similar to John in Revelation, ch chapter 10, verse 9. The eating of the book may have been literal, or only in a vision, but it signified the thorough digesting of its contents. Do you, do you see? The thorough digesting of its contents. We need to fully digest his holy word, okay? And not just bits and pieces of it. You can't just pick off the cherry off the top, you know? We need to, 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 to understand the full thing. We need to digest it. We need to eat it up. If your Bible is, is collecting dust, that means you haven't let your, you haven't, tasted of it. You have not tasted his word. You have not tasted of God. You know nothing. Okay? Get in there and start eating. Okay? And the message became part of the Ezekiel. Ezekiel was also warned that while he would declare God's message, there would be a time when he would be completely silent. Okay? So the Lord would make him mute. He was to speak as God commanded and give the message. The siege of Jerusalem symbolically enacted, chapters 4 through 7. The prophets often used symbolic acts to demonstrate their message. Isaiah had walked naked and barefoot for three years. That's in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3. Jeremiah wore a yoke on his neck. Jeremiah chapter 27, verses 1 and 2. Ezekiel made an outline of the city of Jerusalem on a, mic on a mud brick, portraying the, walls, the fall of, of Jerusalem. That's chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. Okay, Ezekiel was commanded by God to lay on his, lie on his left side 390 days and on his right side 40 days, representing punishment of the northern kingdom and of the southern kingdom, which each day symbol, uh, symbolizes a year. Okay, that's chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. In the Septuagint, 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 I don't know, 
This number, 390, verse 4, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 4, verse 5, is translated as 190, which is the approximate period from 722 BC to 536 BC. If it is the larger number, the period of time would extend into the Greek period of Alexander the Great. Ezekiel's action was also thought of being symbolic of the, the Egyptian servitude. A sign of, of famine was also given okay, by Ezekiel, uh, chapter 4, verses 9 through 17. Hunger and cannibalism. Ooh, hunger and cannibalism were evident in the last days of Jerusalem. Ezekiel's eating of loathsome bread was, was that of a famine diet. Okay. Ezekiel shaved off his hair, burned part of it, and scattered the rest of the winds. Chapter 5, symbolic of the fate of Jerusalem and its people. The city is doomed, and horror is going to come upon it. Chapters 6 through 7. These two chapters are a sort of dirge over the destruction of Jerusalem and the desolation of the land of Israel. Through this destruction, the Jews will come to know that God is God. Okay. A vision of Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through, through 11. Ezekiel is transported by the Spirit in this vision and enabled to see what was taking place in Jerusalem. He was shown abhorrent idolatries were, which were being practiced in the temple. The image of jealousy, chapter 8, verse 3, was probably that of Asin, uh, Ar Ar Astarte. Astarte. Okay, so look that up, Astarte. Okay. The people were also engaged in secret animal worship. These are all Babylonian, ancient Babylonian satanic practices, okay, that are carried throughout now, even even now they're apparent in in the Illuminati, the Freemasons, you know, um, the Mormon church uses some of the symbolisms from that, but um, yeah, so this is the synagogue of Satan kind of beginning, the Freeman beginnings, I think, the very first hints of this. The people were also engaged in secret animal worship, which was probably from an Egyptian cult. Okay? Uh, chapter 8, through, uh, verse 10. In spite of repeated warnings and threats of punishment, Judah was sinking lower and lower in the depths of idolatry. An abomination to God. As a result of their sins, severe punishment was forthcoming. This punishment and slaughter of the idolaters in Jerusalem is seen in chapter 9. The cherubim, chapter 1, reappear and seem to superintend the destruction and slaughter of Jerusalem, chapter 10. There is also a vision of the future re restoration of those who are in exile, chapter 11. After being humbled, purified, and freed from idolatry, there is a promise of restoration. Ezekiel Act. Acts is the part of an exile. Chapter 12. Even though the people refused to listen, Ezekiel continued to, to declare God's message. In this chapter, there is another symbolic illustration in emphasizing Jerusalem's impending captivity. Ezekiel prophesied in exact detail the events which occurred later. False prophets. Chapter 13. False prophets were constantly undermining the work of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. The false prophets claiming that they had authority from God told the people what they wanted to hear. Doesn't that sound like what's going on now? The, you know, it, what's described in Timothy, the book of Timothy, where, you know, um, people are hearing strange doctor, you know, doctrines to tickle their ears. They're turning away from sound doctrine to, to, to you know, listen to uh, fables and, and false doctrines to tickle their ears. It's just like, you know, in the book of Ezekiel and in, in Jeremiah. That's how people are now. Okay, there were also prophetesses who practiced magic. Yeah, and many individuals who were under their influence. The consequences of idolatry. Destruction was destined upon the people of Judah because they were worshiping pagan gods instead of one true God. Sorry, of, instead of the, sorry, instead of the one true God. Okay, God demands a special place in the hearts of his people, and as a result of their sinful actions, Judah was doomed. It may be that Daniel's influence on Nebuchadnezzar prolonged their ultimate destruction, but they were soon to be destroyed. The Parable of the Vine, Chapter 15. Ezekiel noted that the wood of the vine was of no value except, for, except to burn as fuel. Jerusalem, destroyed and her people in exile, was useless and as worthless as charred wine wood, uh, vine wood. An Allegory. Chapter 16. Israel's idolatry is presented as that of an unfaithful wife. 
God had taken Israel when she was worthless and reached out to her in grace and mercy. All that she was, she owed to God. God cleansed and purified her and prepared her for marriage, but the bride went off on, into harlotry. The most abominable aspect of their idolatry in, involved human sacrifices. Verse 20. This was highly developed among the Canaanites, and the influence of it extended into the Hebrew community. The parable of the two eagles. You all saw the two eagles. Chapter 17. The first eagle described is King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who took King Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin sorry, of uh, captive. This is verses 3 through 4. The seed of the land was Zedekiah. The seed of the land was Zedekiah. Okay. All right, verse 13, okay, 2 Kings 24, 17. The second eagle is Egypt, to whom Zedekiah soon turned, verse 7. Because of this treachery, Zedekiah was later brought to Babylon for punishment, verses 13 through 21. God also promised that a plant will grow and prosper. The tender twig, the tender twig refers to the Messiah, who will come from the royal family of David, which will be restored, verses 21 through 24. The soul that sin, sinneth shall die. Okay, the, son, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Chapter 18. Okay, so that's what taking responsibility for your own sins is about. That's that clip on that, okay? The prophets had spoken of the failures of preceding generations, which was considered to be the reason the children of Israel were suffering. But Ezekiel stated that the present generation was more wicked than their forefathers, whom they were trying to blame for their hardship. The major emphasis of this chapter is that God judges each man, God judges each man individually, on the basis of his conduct and actions, whereas the prophets generally blame the entire nation for their failures. Ezekiel declared an individual accountability to God. A dirge over the fallen kings of Israel, chapter 19. This poem is written with the familiar rhythm of the dirge. Israel is pictured as a lioness nourishing her whelps. The king and the princes of, of Israel are fallen, and David's family, which was once great and powerful, is overthrown. Jehoaz, the first, the first whelp, verse 3, was taken to Egypt, 2 Kings, chapter 23, uh, verse 31 through 34. The second, verse 5, Jehoiakim, was taken to Babylon. Finally, Zedekiah rebelled, and both the nation and its line of kings would be destroyed. That's verses 10 through 14 in chapter 19, okay? Embankments and Judgments on Israel, chapters 20 through 24. Israel had been deeply involved in the filth of idol worship. Jehovah led Israel, and for his name's sake he will still bless and redeem them after they have been punished from turning away from him. That's chapter 20. The avenging sword of the Lord will come down on Jerusalem, and, Babel, and Babylon will be the instrument used. The term, the south, relates to the land of Judah. Okay, chapter 20, verse 46, chapter 21. Included in the, in the sins listed for Jerusalem in chapter 22 are idolatry, bloodshed, profaning the Sabbath, robbery, various sexual sins, Greed from among greed among the leaders and dishonesty in acquiring material things. A parable contained in chapter twenty three describes two sisters, Ehola and Eholiba. Okay, I think it's who are deeply involved in adultery and lewdness and illustrates the relationship between God and His people. Okay, so the, peop the covenant that the Lord has between Israel and Himself is like a marriage agreement. And the covenant between us, okay, the church and him is like a marriage agreement, okay? And so that's why he uses this adulterous relationship, the behavior of these two sisters to illustrate what we have done, what the Israelites have done, okay, to that relationship. Okay, Ezekiel's last oracle against Jerusalem is the parable of the boiling cauldron, chapter 24, verses 1 through 14 which symbolizes the impending destruction of Jerusalem. When the siege of Jerusalem began, Ezekiel's wife died, chapter 24, verse 15 through 24. Ezekiel was commanded not to weep for her, and silence was imposed on him. Then when Jerusalem fell, the people were stupefied with their grief. Prophecies against the nations, chapter 25 through 32. Four of Judah's closest neighbors and enemies, Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia, rejoiced when Judah fell. 
because these are surrounding areas like Lebanon and Jordan okay and all that area Syria well Syria is up to the north um, so it's more like Jordan and that area okay and Gaza's Rejoice when Judah fell. Okay, Ezekiel prophesied that they would come to the same fate. Nebuchadnezzar later invaded these areas and subdued them. Chapter 25. The year that Jerusalem fell, which was 586 BC, <coughs> sorry, Ezekiel had visions of the downfall of Tyre, a great maritime, maritime town, uh, power in the ancient world located about 50 miles northwest of Nazareth. It was a beautiful place and one of the, one of the great treasures and uh, sorry, and one of great treasure and commerce. It is pictured under the under the imagery of the as a sorry of a majestic ship. Chapter twenty seven. Ezekiel prophesied Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Tyre. Chapter twenty six, which lasted uh, thirteen years. Tyre was also subdued by the Persians and again by Alexander the Great, never to recover its former glory. The king of Tyre felt secure, but he was overthrown, along with Sidon, twenty miles north of Tyre. This is like the Lebanon area, I guess, which was captured at the same time of Nebuchadnezzar. These enemy nations will disappear, but Israel shall be restored. Chapter 28, verse 25 through 26. The next six visions relate to Egypt, chapters 29 through 32. Nebuchadnezzar invaded Egypt and reduced her to a place of minor importance, never to recover or attain her former glory. Okay. Israel's Fallen Restoration, chapters 33 through 37. The prophet pronounced judgment, but he also announced restoration. God doesn't take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. I will say that again. God does not take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. But rather, he wants people to be changed and to live for him. That's uh, chapter 33, verse 11. Ezekiel declared God's message to the people who listened, but generally failed to repent. They listened, but they failed to repent. Some of us listen, but we don't repent. We don't take it serious. You know? Chapter 34 is an indictment on the, on the leaders of Israel, which included the greedy and cruel kings and the priests who exploited the people. The shepherds who should have led Israel in the right path the shepherds that should have led Israel on the right path mm, led them astray sounds like the pastors now especially in America but, but Ezekiel had a vision of a future good shepherd who will lead God's people Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd the Messiah the coming Messiah will shower blessings upon the people and they will not and they will not suffer chapter 34 verses 15 through 26 <coughs> Sorry, I've been speaking a long time, so my voice is starting to crack here. In chapter 35, the people of Edom thought they could possess the land after Judah was taken away, but later they fell to the same fate. The land of Israel was desolate, but one day it will be re-inhabited for the glory of God. It will be like the Garden of Eden, chapter, uh, chapter 36. Jerusalem had been destroyed and her people in exile for about 10 years. But even after the nation's death, Ezekiel promises a restoration. He has a vision of a valley of dry bones taken on flesh and living, chapter 37. Okay, so this is the rebirth of Jerusalem here. Okay. Both Judah and Israel together as the entire nation would ultimately return. Ezra and Nehemiah both predict predicted the return of Judah, but the name is given to the returning people... Sorry, Ezra and Nehemiah predicted the return of Judah, but the name given to the returning people is... Israel. 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 The, the Jews were scattered all over the globe and they were viciously murdered in the Holocaust. They were persecuted throughout the ages and they were all brought together. They all went home to the land of their fathers and in 1948 the land of Israel was established. The term Israel is used in the New Testament, often with reference to the Jews in general. The dead, dry bones, will live in the restoration of the nation of Israel. In Ezekiel's visions of the future, the major emphasis is placed on the Messiah, referred to in Ezekiel as the Prince and the Shepherd, among other titles. Gog and Magog. We heard a lot about this now. 
prophecy of Ezekiel 38, Gog and Magog. So who are they? You saw in that map that I put in the slide, if you want to go back and look at that, who they are. Okay. In these two chapters, okay, in these two chapters is found a discussion of Gog and Magog. The land of Magog was ruled by Gog. The sons of Jep Jepeth, Jepeth, mentioned in Genesis 10, and chapter 10, verse 2, are Magog, Meshesh, Tubal, and, Gom and Gomer, the, form the founders of the northern group of nations, okay, like Russia, and all up there. Okay, according to Ezekiel 27, 13, slaves were sold to Tyre by Meshesh and Tubal. There is a speculation concerning the meaning of Rosh. Some conclude that Rosh is the same as Russia. Meshesh is thought to mean Moscow, or Muscovy, which is an ancient Russian name, or a people called Moshi, spoken of as dwelling in the Caucasus in the Assyrian inscriptions. Tubal is believed to be Tobolsk, which is a Siberian city, or a people called Tiburini, on the southeastern shores of the Black Sea. Where's the Black Sea at? It's in Russia! Well, actually, former Soviet Union. I think also in that area is Ukraine, Ukraine and Poland. Poland, maybe not. No, not Poland, but Ukraine and what's Czechoslovakia. I think are over in that area. So yeah, it's the former, you know, Soviet Union or the old Russia. Okay, Gomer is thought to have been the Sumerians who came from the north through the Caucasus in the days of the Assyrian Empire and occupied parts of Asia Minor. Maybe the Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan and all that area. Okay. But were driven back. to uh, Tugarma is thought to be Armenia. Ezekiel speaks of these people as dwelling in the uttermost parts of the north. Ezekiel 38, uh, verse 6, 15, and chapter 39, uh, verse 2. Whatever their exact identification may be, there can be little doubt that they were nations beyond the Caucasus. Can't say that. Ka, 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 <sighs> Sorry. It, it is apparent that this is the part of the world known as Russia. These barbaric, these barbaric, they were barbaric people were spoken of in ancient literature as Scythians, okay, or Scythians. During this, the time of Ezekiel, uh, Southwest Asia was terrorized by hordes of them pouring in from the north. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, another Scythian, a Scythian invasion on a greater scale together with people from the east is predicted. Ezekiel 38, verse 5. This invasion would go into the Holy Land against restored, against restored Israel. So that would be now, you know. In the latter days. In the latter days. Ezekiel 38, 8. With God's help, there will be such will be there will be such a great defeat that their weapons will supply fuel for seven years, and it will take seven months to bury the dead. So there's going to be a lot of dead people up there. So probably the people of Russia are going to come up against Israel real soon here, because they're going to want what Israel has. Okay, and they're going to go to battle against Israel. It's about it's about things. They want something from Israel. Okay. So, uh, anyway, um, next verse here. The same words are used in the book of Revelation, and Gog and Magog are used as representing nations in, Satan, in Satan's final attempt to destroy God's people. Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. A vision of the temple, chapters 40 through 48. This remarkable vision of Ezekiel concerning a temple has, a numerous, has numerous interpretations. It was somewhat... <clears throat> similar to Solomon's temple that was destroyed in uh, 586 BC. This is an idealized replica, and some would conclude that it was, on, it was the one that was to be built upon the return from Babylon, while others see it as a description of the kingdom of God in its final form. Some relate it to the earthly Christian church. It seems that Ezekiel's temple is the future one to be constructed in Palestine. You saw that at the end of the clip here. During the coming kingdom age, Okay, so that's the third temple. I saw, you know, the uh, computer graphics that they put out. I saw um, a YouTube, somebody posted, I forget who, that talked about. It was, these, it was the council for building, the, you know, the, the temple. 
and they already have everything planned out. The blueprints are there, and they even have what it'll look like. You know, so a computer-generated image of what the inside is. And I've seen it. It's it's massive. Okay, it was pretty awesome. So anyway, um, so it, it seems that Ezekiel's temple is the future one to be constructed to be constructed <coughs> in Palestine during the coming kingdom age. This prophet apparently envisioned the millennial temple, the millennial temple, with its worship and the land during that time. Details are given concerning the arrangement of the temple. Chapter 41. The holiness of God is emphasized and the divine glory is in the temple. Chapter 42, verses 1 through 4, through uh, chapter 43, verse 17. It is also a center for divine government and a place for religious activity. Chapter 43, verse 7 through 27. Worship and spiritual activities through the kingdom age are described in the final chapters of Ezekiel. Chapters 44 through 46. In these chapters is pictured the river of the sanctuary and a description of the boundaries and apportionment of the land. Ezekiel envisions the city of Jerusalem as it will exist in the kingdom age. The book closes with Ezekiel referring to the new Jerusalem and saying, The Lord is here. I'm oh, sorry, the Lord is there. Okay, so I was going to read chapter 2, but this intro was a good... One, two, three, four, five pages long, so I will come back with chapter two in a little bit. Okay, with that said, I bless you all in the, in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach. I love you. If you have a prayer request, please let me know. I'm out. Bye.